you ever been totally stumped by something? So completely confused that all you can do is throw up your hands and say, I don't get it. When I was growing up, I remember hearing people at church talk about how they look forward to a time when after they'd left this life behind, they would finally understand those kinds of things, right? I don't hear people say that much anymore. Maybe they still do. Maybe you've said it. Have you ever thought that? Boy, I can't wait until, until the next life and I can just finally figure out all these answers, finally understand what, what everybody's talking about. I wonder where that idea comes from that we'll finally get all the answers. I don't mean to imply that it's wrong. I just, I wonder where it came from. I suppose we could get it from Paul in 1 Corinthians when he says, now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. But truth be told, I don't see that promise really anywhere in Scripture. In fact, if anything, Jesus seems to imply today that that kind of understanding is something that is available to us now through the Holy Spirit. Now, I doubt he was talking about differential calculus or quantum mechanics or how many licks it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop. <laughs> but he seems serious when he says that the advocate, the spirit of truth, will guide us into all truth by declaring to us the things that are to come. Now, I don't know about you. I certainly don't have the gift of prognostication. I can't even tell you what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. So if that's not what Jesus is talking about, what does he mean? And is that promise for all of Jesus' disciples or just for a few of us? Remember that all this we've been reading from John's gospel in these last weeks comes from just before Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion. This is his last night with his friends. I can almost hear the urgency in his voice as he tries to leave them with some parting words of wisdom, some advice to get them through the rough road that lies ahead. And finally, knowing that what he really wants them to know isn't something that can be taught, he points them to the advocate who is coming to help them continue to learn those things to continue growing in relationship with God. Because that's what Jesus does throughout his life, isn't it? He takes what the Father has given him and he shares it with those around him. And it's never been about teaching rules or concepts or tenets. Whether it's showing up to a party with a truckload of the best wine or engaging in a lonely conversation with a woman at a well in the heat of the day or supper with his friends, what Jesus does time and time again, what he does his whole life, is offers himself in relationship. And so I find myself wondering if it is in itself, if that relationship is in itself, the wisdom, the advice, the hope, the truth, the good news that he wants to share with his friends before he leaves. Not moral codes or creeds, but relationship. Today is Trinity Sunday, a day on which we celebrate an idea rooted in relationship. God as three in one and one in three. That whole concept of Trinity is so hard to understand and even harder to describe Often the temptation for somebody like me on Trinity Sunday is to use some clever model or analogy to try to explain Trinity, like a three-leaf clover or an apple or the sun. Trinity has always been one of those things that maybe we've hoped that we could understand someday uh, in the next level. But after hearing Jesus' words today, I find myself wondering... If maybe Trinity isn't something that needs to be explained so much as it is something that is in itself an explanation. I wonder if Trinity is the model that God uses to explain to us who we are. The idea of Trinity says that God is three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are separate but also not separate. They are three yet only one. 
There are not three different expressions or perspectives of a single person. Neither are there three individual gods or three parts of a whole. Trying to understand it is enough to drive a person crazy. But only because we don't really know who God is or who we are. We see the world through the lens of separate beings, separate individuals. But what if we're not as separate as we like to think we are? It's easy to look at other people, especially those that we hate or fear or disagree with, and see how different they are from us. What we often fail to see is how alike we all are. Even in our different appearances and opinions and beliefs. For all the myriad expressions of humanity, even the myriad expressions of life, it's the same humanity that drives everything about us. We all have the same biological instincts and drives, the same hopes and fears, the same motivations. They just manifest in different ways. I wonder if that sameness is deeper than just something that we all have in common. I wonder if on some level we really are all one and the same, even in our diversity. I wonder if that kind of unity is how all creation was designed from the beginning. Take this poem from Proverbs, written from the perspective of wisdom, who is the cornerstone of all creation. I read this poem and I hear it describing this underlying logic or pattern upon which all creation is founded. Something in which God delights from the very beginning. And I wonder if this poem is a poet's way of saying that wisdom, not, not just general wisdom or experience or knowledge, but that special, that wisdom of God that is the basis of all creation, is the key to experience life as it was meant to be experienced. In the following chapter, Lady Wisdom stands at her door and beckons to passers-by to come in and partake of her rich feast. Meanwhile, Lady Folly entices folks to the same, but rather than offering rich foods, all she has to offer is death. And so I wonder if this might be, if this wisdom might be Trinity itself. The Son abiding in the Father, and the Father in the Son, and the Father and the Son in all of us, and all of us in them. God and humanity and all creation together. This is how God created the world. It's the pattern, the blueprint, the master design of all creation. If all of us are created in the image of the one God, the image of Trinity, then that common imago Dei makes us one, not only with God, but with one another. This is the truth that is built into us, always calling us somewhere, some, to something else that we can't really describe. And so I wonder if, it, by choosing instead to live sep separated, individuated lives over and against one another, divorced from this great unity for which we were created, we've instead accepted Folly's invitation. And that's why we remain mired in destructive systems, stuck in harmful ideologies and destructive patterns. Why we remain hungry for something more. Why we hope for a heaven someday where everything is better. If faith or spirituality or, or religion offers nothing more than a rule for living or means of judging or excluding other people, then I cannot believe that it is in any way what Jesus is trying to share with us. And least of all, what he would want to try to give to his friends on his last night on earth. And yet so often this is all faith is. It's all we ask from it. I think this is what Jesus means when he says that this advocate will prove us wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. 
when we use faith or religion as a means to separate or reject or judge one another, we're fundamentally misusing it. The truth, the truth to which I hear Jesus testifying is that we are all one because the God who made us is one. And this is the God who abides in us and in whom we abide. Beginning in about the fourth century, the church, thanks in large part to, incidentally, Basil the Great and Gregory of Nazianzus and Gregory of Nyssa, whom the church commemorates on Tuesday, the church began to describe the Trinitarian relationship of God with the Greek word perichoresis. There's a $10 theological word for you, perichoresis. Choreo is the root of our English word choreography. And the prefix peri means around. And so perichoresis then might be described as like a great big circular dance. A dance in which the Father and the Son and the Spirit whirl around one another so fast that we can't tell them apart. I like that image of perichoresis to describe the Trinity because I see in these texts God opening up that dance to invite us in. Not each one of us individually, but all of us, all of creation together. God makes room, which is another definition of perichoresis. God makes room for us in this dance that is God's own self. It seems to me that we've become far too interested with the individual dancers and who they are in relation to one another. And that misdirected theology has taught us to rationalize and justify violence and oppression and corruption for centuries. That kind of wisdom upon which that faith is built is, in the words of Proverbs, nothing but folly. And folly offers only death. Here, I see Jesus pointing us away from the dancers and instead to the dance itself that the dance is God. That this relationship, this true wisdom, this spirit of truth offers us abundant life. Jesus testifies with this life and this teaching and even this, with his very body how God makes room for us in this dance. That this dance is where our home is and where it has always been since the world was formed. Oneness with God and with one another and with everything that exists, that oneness is the wisdom upon which creation was founded. It's the language in which existence was written. I see Jesus here inviting us, all of us together into God's self as friends, and as co-participants in the eternal dance. The more I read and the more I pray and the more I seek and the more I search, the more convinced I become that love is the wisdom that orders our lives. I can't explain it. All I can say is that it rings true to me. I hear something reaching out to me like responding to like, something deep inside me recognizes its own, itself. Love is our substance. It's our source code. It's our essence. All things were created as one, and all things will again be one. And in fact, if we have the eyes to see it, all things already are one. If that is true, if that oneness is one of these things to come that the Spirit declares to us, then how does that truth order our lives? How does it inform our relationships with the co-participators in God surrounding us? What does it mean for us in the midst of conflict or oppression or violence? It would be nice to have a set of hard and fast rules to help us find those answers. 
But the only answer we have is the dance. Every dance is more than just steps and rhythm and music, isn't it? We can read theology and scripture all day, but in the end, Jesus reminds us that there is only so much we can bear to hear at once. At some point, the only way to learn to dance is to start dancing. And I'm convinced that that's what God is up to. I think scripture and faith and even life itself is God's great invitation to get up and join in this perichoretic reality. In fact, I wonder if that's what salvation really is. Dancing into the reality that has existed in God since the beginning.